Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming, and thank you mostly for uh, spending your lunch hour today here. And those that are um, online, uh, thank you for joining us as well. Um, I'm very much looking forward to talking about weight today with everybody. Weight is an issue in our country. 60% of us in the United States are not at a healthy weight. If you let that sink in for a second, that means normal is not to be at a healthy weight. So that means the environment and the society around us is creating something that is now a new normal, which is to be abnormal, right? And so that makes it even harder to become what's actually normal, right? When you're fighting against the world that's fighting against you, it makes it very challenging to accomplish your goals. And whether you're here today to learn something new or to keep your weight stable or to lose a little weight, I hope that you get at least something today that you can take home and start today um, with, with your next meal or your next movement activity or your next sleep cycle tonight when you go to bed. So we're going to talk about these five key things that affect our weight and how we can manage them because most of these five things we're going to talk about are things that we can do, things we can control. Because there's a lot of factors we can't control, right? We can't control what's being sold out there at the market. We can't control as much about um, you know, the fact that we uh, have trouble with transportation and, and have to drive instead of walk a lot of times. But the things we can control, we want to be able to take charge. So we also want to recognize, too, that struggles with our weight are not people's fault, right? There's been a huge resurgence in the United States around people feeling like it's their fault that they, that they have too much weight. And we want to get away from that because it's not our fault. It's not our fault at all. In fact, it's just like any other disease. It's not our fault so much that we have high blood pressure. It's not our fault if we have cancer, we have lung disease or other diseases, right? But we have these diseases and we have to be, take a responsibility if we want to affect change. And that's what we really want to learn about today. And where this fits in, right, is this is National Heart Association Month, and heart disease is one of the biggest chronic diseases that we have in the country, right? And all of these chronic diseases have a role in our weight in our food environment, right? So the way we eat, what we put in our bodies, what we do to our bodies, how we move them, um, how we sleep, all affects the chronic disease prevalence in our country. And it's going up and up and up. Right now there's about, about 157 million Americans that have some sort of a chronic disease diabetes, high blood pressure, cancer, um, kidney disease, all of these things uh, play a role. And by 2030, just 10 years from now, that's going to uh, continue to climb. And the big part about this, too, is that it costs us a lot of money. Um, so as far as health care costs and as far as also just uh, quality of life, our quality of life gets worse the more diseases we have. So we want to live a healthy life, but we also want to live a happy life. Um, and we want to be comfortable and we want to uh, do what's right. This image is going to change. It's probably a little hard to see online. But the idea is you can see it rotating. Here is 2011, where most of the country is yellow. And as we progress across to 2017, most of the country here becomes red. Red in this, this is a um, graphical representation of our obesity rates in the country. Um, I'll just orient you a little bit. So light green is about is 20% of the country, 20% uh, of the population struggling with the disease of obesity. And bright red, or dark red, is greater than 35%. So you can see here in this sort of area where greater than 35% of people now in 2017 are really struggling uh, with their weight um, as it relates to having the disease of obesity. Colorado, there's something special about Colorado. You see, watch it. It stays green like the whole time. So <laughs> we're not quite sure why that is, but it's fairly interesting if you just look at it from an epidemiological standpoint. You know, what, what's going on in Colorado is the altitude. Um, you know, there are various uh, theories around Colorado, um, but that's the interesting part. The other interesting part that they're using um, data like this, just so you know, and they're doing some research on is, you know, what is special too about the fact that you can see that most of this red sort of sequesters down here in this, in this lower southern area. And again, um, researchers are now looking at our gut microbiome, for example. You may have heard that term before. That's like the, the type of bacteria that live in our colon. Um, and that plays a significant role. Our bacteria in our colon um, are directly related to our environment we live in. And so now people are looking at that gut microbiome that's here even in Boston, um, a lot of that research is being done, and trying to plot it against these areas, right, that have these diseases like obesity, and say, hey, is there something going on with these people's environment down here? You know, that's making them more prone to having uh, this disease or having this problem, because our our gut bacteria are very important. Every day I see a new article about 
our mental health even, um, Alzheimer's disease, all these chronic diseases that are coming about now are related to these gut bacteria um, in our colon and how we, how we feed them. We're gonna talk about that a little bit later. So when we talk about obesity, um, we're talking about uh, a medical term. This is a diagnosis, a disease. But really what it's a marker of is excess energy storage. So the body is storing excess energy that it shouldn't have, that it doesn't necessarily need, and it's storing that in some sort of um, unusual way or in a way that's not healthy, right? That's the idea. We estimate this body fat storage, this excess fat, by something called a BMI, which is a body mass index. That's literally just a calculation of your weight divided by your height, okay? And so there's a special calculation. It's your height in meters squared and your weight in kilograms. You can go online, there's calculators, you can plug in and see what your BMI is. Um, but effectively, if your BMI is in the 25 to 29 range, then you're considered overweight. If you have a BMI greater than or equal to 30, you're considered to have the disease of obesity, and you have severe obesity if it's greater than 40. What that means is that as our BMI increases, the, the, where this data comes from, BMI was never meant to be a number assigned to you, or to you, or to you, or to me, right? To say, I need to get to a certain number, right? Kind of like, you know, if you're trying to get somewhere, you know, you have to travel 12 miles to get there, right? There's just 12 miles. It never was designed to be a number to say, Dr. Fitch, you have to get to a BMI of 25 to be normal, okay? What it was from is a bunch of population. People got together, they put all these BMIs together, these epidemiologists, people that look at numbers all the time, and they said, well, look, when people's BMI is higher, they have more diseases, right? So it's a correlative thing. Because if you look at somebody like, for example, Michael Phelps's BMI, it might be even in this overweight range because he's got so much muscle mass, right? But he's not, he's not overweight, right? If you walk into that room and I'm seeing him, you know, I, before I go in, if I see his BMI is 26, I might think, oh, I better talk to this person about what they can do, you know, to lower their BMI. I walk in, I see this elite athlete with, 4% body fat, right? That, which is not something I'm gonna to talk to him about, right? And so that's the, the, the case is not so much to try to get to a certain number, but to understand that number predicts your, your body's health as it relates to other diseases that associate with your weight. Because this is what I'm talking about. It's really more about fat. Here you see a picture of a woman that weighs 155 pounds in both pictures. But in the first picture, her BMI again is 28, but she has 45% body fat. She has a lot of fat in this midsection here. Um, she has metabolic syndrome, which is the disease of, of having um, increased storage of body fat. She has diabetes at this point, right? Even though her BMI is 28, um, because she's storing this excess body fat and the excess fat is what's making, causing disease or causing harm in her body. As she works out and as she um, works on eating differently, sleeping better, all the things we're gonna talk about in a second, she can lower that body fat down to 30% and she's in good shape. So no longer does she have these diseases. So it's really about working on that fat as much as it is about working on your weight. And in the United States, you know, we get so caught up on that number on the scale and when the number's not going down, then we give up and we quit and we quit doing all these healthy behaviors that we're doing. We, we might not exercise as much, we might not eat as well because we're like, oh, the number's not changing but your fat might be changing, right? And people will tell me that all the time in the weight center, they'll come in and say, you know, well, my clothes are fitting better, but the number on the scale isn't going down, right? And I'm like, I'm okay with that. You know, that's, that's, a, that's, that's good. That's what you wanna do. So in the weight center, we measure your body fat percentage with a special uh, scale. We have devices now that can measure our body fat percentage. In fact, you can get one for home. There's several high quality devices these days that measure your body composition. They measure your body fat, your muscle. Um, they're around $100 or less um, at Best Buy and Amazon and all sorts of things. And it's a body composition scale. It'll tell you what that fat looks like and how much you have and how much you can try to get rid of it. This is the normal body fat percentages as we talked about BMI, right? We wanna get to a normal fat range. And for women here, this is women at the top. Uh, we want to get to about less than 35% is considered normal. And for men, it's about less than 25% considered normal. So again, women, as women, we carry a little extra fat. We're supposed to do that. And the prime reason for that is because we bear children. And so if we didn't have the ability to store extra fat in times of famine, we wouldn't be able to have children and the whole race would die off. So there was a purpose for that uh, way back in the day. And so these are the medical complications of storing too much energy as fat. And so one of the big ones that have come about in the literature that you may see is cancer. 
So there's a 30% reduction in your risk of cancer if you lose 5 to 10% of your weight, especially those cancers that are hormone related, like breast cancer, endometrial cancer, prostate cancer. These cancers, you reduce your risk by losing that fat. Fat is inflammatory. When you have excess body fat, it makes your system um, inflamed and irritated and you don't feel very good. And it also makes you have higher risks of having these diseases. One of the other big diseases that we see too, and some of you may struggle with it, is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. This means there's an extra storage of fat in your liver and your liver is irritated by it. This is now becoming the number one reason for liver transplant in our country today. So no longer is it hepatitis C, uh, which is what used to be the number one reason for transplant, but now it's because of too much storage of fat in our livers, okay? And then that causes liver damage long term, and then people need to have a transplant. So a five to 10% weight loss is really key. It reduces your risk of mortality, that means death, by 20 to 30%. By losing five to 10% and keeping it off forever. So you can't just go on a diet and lose 10% of your weight, right? Which would be like 20 pounds for some people if you weigh 200 pounds. You lose 10%, you lose 20 pounds. The other problem we have in society is we're not very happy with that usually. Like we lose 20 pounds, we're like, I mean, every day people come in and I say, oh, you've done so great, you've lost 10 pounds. Yeah, I could have done better. I'm like, well, no, you couldn't do better. I mean, that's really great that you did that, right? That's like a feat beyond all physical abilities and yet you're sad about it, right? And so we have to also change our framework and work on these little five to 10% intervals as much as we can on an ongoing basis. Losing 5 to 10% and keeping it off forever, so not a diet where you lose 5% and then go back to some old way of living, right? You have to change your lifestyle forever. Decreases your risk of developing diabetes by 58%. But not once you already have it. Not once you already have it, although <coughs> losing weight does reduce your A1C as well as improve your diabetes control. And we'll talk about it a little bit later. A significant amount of weight loss actually reverses diabetes, but that significant amount of weight loss is typically only attainable by bariatric surgery. By what? By bariatric surgery, oh. by having surgery for weight loss. And we're gonna talk about that at the end because it's all about how much can we get out of each treatment, right? It turns out we can only get about five to 10% by doing things like Weight Watchers or online things or um, behavioral programs or working on things by ourselves. Five to 10% is as much as we can get, right? That's just the way the human body is. Very similar to, you only get a certain amount of results with chemotherapy for cancer, right? So with cancer treatment, you have chemotherapy, you have radiation, you have surgery. You have all three of those things at the same time usually because you need all three to make the cancer go away because you need all that power to make that result happen. And with weight loss, it's no different. You need a lot of power to make things happen because things just don't happen like we think they do. Because yes, there might be one out of 100 people that's able to lose 100 pounds without surgery or without um, any kind of medication for their treatment, right? But that's one out of 100 people. And those are people on the cover of People magazine or whatever magazine, you know, I lost 100 pounds, I kept it off forever. Great for them and they are the, one of the lucky ones and they did it and they did it without surgery, they did it without medicines, they did it without Dr. Fitch. <laughs> or maybe they had somebody like Dr. Fitch to help them too. <laughs> but the point is that, that they're one out of 100 and you can try to be the one out of 100. I tell patients that every day. Right, I encourage you to be the one out of 100. But for a lot of people, they need help more than, they wanna be more than the one out of 100. And also, again, as it relates to heart disease here, decrease your LDL, your cholesterol by 15% by a five to 10% weight loss. That's as good as some of the statin therapies that we have, some of the medications people go on um, for treating cholesterol. And that doesn't mean you don't take cholesterol medicine uh, because sometimes there's another reason for taking cholesterol medicine, but doing this really helps to also improve your numbers as well. So there's a theory that um, everybody has a set point for energy storage, which is why it's so hard to lose weight and hard to get past that 10%. That once we start losing weight, our body fights back and wants to go back to a weight. Our body's very good at protecting our weight, right? I tell people it's not normal to lose weight. If you're losing weight, something's wrong with you. You're starving in the jungle or you're, you, know, you have cancer or you have something bad happening to you. So your body knows that, right? It's not stupid and it says, hey, wait a minute, this woman's losing weight. We better stop this process right now because I don't wanna like, you know, I don't wanna die, I wanna preserve myself. Uh, and so the idea is that potentially we all have this set point. 
And this might be Susie. She has a set point down here of 22 to 24. Well, lucky her, right? I mean, she's one of those people that I go to lunch with, and it's like, you know, she can eat all this stuff, and then, not, you know, she doesn't gain any weight. And I'm like, oh, you know, how come you can do that? I can't do that, right? I have to watch what I need. I have to exercise every day. I have to do all these things. It's not fair. It's not fair that I have to do that, and Susie doesn't have to do that. Well, like my dad used to say, if dad's watching, is uh, life's not fair, right? And so, you know, you have to just take what you get and, and don't throw a fit, I guess. That's what we used to say to my son. Um, Rachel here sits around 30 to 33. Again, a little bit less lucky, right? She's maybe a little bit what we would call stocky or built or, you know, again, like myself coming from my German heritage. We'll talk about that in a second. I mean, people are bigger, right? We're not tiny people, right? When we come from Germany. And just so you know, I lost 30 pounds. So I was a lot stockier. I hear somebody laughing up front at maybe that I, that I don't struggle with my weight, but I've lost 30 pounds and I've kept it off. And that's 15% of my total weight when it started. So that's a, a big feat, you know, for me to do that. So John up here, unfortunately, his set point sits around 50. And that's really a challenge for him to be successful with weight then, if his body's always kind of trying to go back to that 50, which is a lot of weight and is really heavy. And what determines this set point? What, what affects this thermostat, right? Well, the biggest effector of it is genetics. And we can't change our genes, unfortunately, right? Um, and not yet. I mean. Um, but we can't affect them. We'll talk about that in a second. It turns out some of the things you do actually can change some of your genetic responses to, you can kind of change your genes uh, in an, what's called an epigenetic way. But the other things that we have control of are the things we're going to talk about here, which is our processed diets and our irregular eating patterns. The idea we have food available all the time at 2 o'clock in the morning, at you know, various other times. The idea that we have a lot of processed food. That's becoming more and more apparent. If you take one thing away from today, because um, it's a little warm in here before everybody falls asleep, is that um, <laughs> one thing away is that if you can improve your dietary quality by not eating processed food or eating less processed food, meaning you know less hamburger buns, less bread. I mean, even bread is processed. Cheerios are processed. These are things that are you know considered healthy for you. The American Heart Association slaps their seal on the Cheerios, right? But it's a processed food. Right? It's made with whole grains, but the whole grains aren't whole anymore. Someone chopped them up and puffed them up and put them in a Cheerio. Right? And so again, the less processed food we eat, the more whole foods, natural food we eat, the better off we are. Inadequate physical activity. Okay? So the less active we are, the, the more our set point goes up. Okay? So it's like a vicious cycle. It keeps going around, and the more our set point goes up, the more weight we gain, the less active we are. Right? And so we have to try to break that cycle by increasing our activity. Inadequate sleep. So when we don't sleep enough, we actually gain weight, irregardless of what we're trying to do. So whether we don't sleep enough or whether we have sleep apnea and we're not using a machine or we can't tolerate a machine, if you have sleep apnea, I tell patients, and you're not able to wear a machine, you're losing 150 calories in the night, which is like a half hour in the gym. Okay? So wearing CPAP, if you have sleep apnea, is like getting a half hour, a free half hour in the gym just by sleeping. It turns out sleeping burns a lot of calories, especially REM sleep, which is the sleep that happens more towards the end of our sleep cycle. Okay? So we'll talk about that a little bit at the end. Stress. The chronic stress of our lives is, is adding to increased cortisol, increased hormones that promote fat storage. And so we have to de-stress, whether that's doing yoga or meditating or doing something to de-stress every day is key to your long-term health, um, irregardless of your weight. And then some of these things, like weight-increasing medications, make it harder for us to lose weight because there's a lot of medications that then promote our fat to be stored. For example, um, hormone therapy after breast cancer, um, those aromatase inhibitors make it harder to lose weight, make it harder, um, more easily to store fat. And then the last one is life changes, aging, pregnancy, uh, menopause for women. Uh, for men, it's a decrease in testosterone or <coughs> menopause, if you will. As men get older, they lose testosterone and also struggle with fat storage at that point. All these factors jack up that set point and make it even harder for us to go back in the direction we want to go. But again, each of these we have to work on fixing, and we can't fix them all at once, right? We have to work on them as best we can, one at a time. Very briefly on genetics. These two guys are identical twins raised in different environments, separated at birth, yet they look quite a bit different. You can see this gentleman might struggle a little bit with his weight, but certainly not to the level that this gentleman struggles with with his weight. So the fact that he grew up in a different environment related to his genes in a different way. 
So there's genes, for example, where if you eat a highly processed food environment, like let's say you eat at McDonald's, and not to pick up McDonald's, could be Burger King, Wendy's, any fast food restaurant. You eat there every day, okay, for your, for your food. You might not even eat that much, but eating that highly processed food with that high, trans, that high fat content can turn on genes in certain individuals, not others. Some people can eat there every day and be fine, right? Other people, they eat there every day, it actually turns on genes in their body that makes them store that food as fat better. Okay, so that's not good, right? You don't wanna do that, right? So if you're in a certain environment and you turn on some of these genes that you have inside of you but you didn't know, and you turn them on by your environmental, by what you're eating and what's around you, um, that can make it more of a problem for you. We don't have this level of personalized medicine yet, but this is the future of what we're working on, you know, is how best to determine for you, the individual, you know, how can we help you do the best we can? We can't change our genes, we can't give you a gene transplant, right? But we can help, um, you know, understand them at least so we can work around them or work with them. And this is what I want you to take away. These are these five key steps. We're going to talk about each one um, in, in order. Uh, these are my five P's, I said, and I, I remember this because I had five fingers on one hand, and when I wanted to talk to people about their weight, I was like, okay, i got to remember five things i got to talk about, and if I remember them like this, it's going to be easier. So plan portions, okay? We need to plan what we're going to eat, and we need to portion control, and we need to decide what that food's going to look like because the world out there is deciding for us today, and 60% of us are struggling, right? Plants, plants have a lot of power, and we're going to talk about that. Protein. Protein is very important for keeping us full, making us feel full. It's also important for maintaining our muscle mass. As we age, we lose muscle mass. And if we don't eat enough protein, we lose that, and then we proportionally get fatter, right? If your muscle mass is going down and your fat is going up, your fat gets worse. The percentage or the amount of fat relative to your entire body weight gets higher, right? And so that number goes from 30% to 40% because you've just lost muscle and you've gained a little bit of fat. So maintaining that muscle is key. And then power, that's how we maintain that muscle, by doing something powerful every day. And pillow, which is getting good sleep, because we talked about that, we, we hinted on that. And Michael Pollan is a food, is a writer, a wonderful writer. If you don't know his work or if you've read his work, I hope they have it in the library. If not, we'll probably have to, I'll donate that, put that on the list. <laughs> um, but um, he said, he had it plain and simple. Eat food, not too much, and mostly plants. So people come in every day asking me what they should do for their weight, and I have a lot of other tips, and there's a lot of other individual things. But in a nutshell, this is what we have to do. We have to eat food, we have to eat not too much, we have to eat it regularly and not chaotically, like here and there and everywhere, and we have to eat mostly plants, and we do better. And this is illustrated here in that 63% of our diet in America is processed food now. This is even old data, this is way back from 2009. So it's likely to be even higher today. I couldn't find an updated version of a nice graph like that that shows that, right? Of the 12% that is plant food, okay, of the 12%, up to half of that, or 6%, is, is like processed, you can't read it here, but says like, for example, almonds and candy bars, apples and apple pies. So they're cutting the apples and the apple pie as part of the plants up here. So almost half of that is still in processed food, right? So almost half of those plants are in something processed already, okay? Um, and so this is really key. Kevin Hall is a researcher at the NIH. He's a wonderful researcher. He's devoted his career here to researching our weight and why our weight has challenges, right? And one of the studies that he just did looked at that. He put people in a lab and he fed them ultra-processed food, which would be things like chicken nuggets and, and SpaghettiOs and other types of food, and then he fed them just regular food, like baked chicken with broccoli and some, some brown rice, right? and showed that there was a significant difference, calorie for calorie, controlled, right? There was a significant difference in the processed food people, the people that ate that processed food and how their bodies reacted to it. And this is the key too, is processed carbohydrates. A lot of our food is, that's processed is processed carbohydrates, right? We're not talking so much maybe about something like beef jerky or something that's just dried meat, right? Um, but Because it's processed. But we're talking more about things like processed carbohydrates. And this, I like this graph because it's really just an illustration. It's kind of old. It only goes up to 2,000. But the bar graphs here are our obesity rates in the country. So here's the prevalence of obesity. And in, in 2,000, 27% of people uh, struggle with obesity, OK? Um, and so again, the bar graphs are the obesity rates. The line graph is our processed carbohydrate consumption. And you can see here where in 1980, 
um, something happened in our food environment, 80 to 85, and there was a whoo, you know, it took off and went that direction. And, and if, if people don't know, I'm from Iowa, and something happened in Iowa in particular, I remember that, because I was in high school in the 80s, um, and there was something called Farm Aid. And Willie Nelson came, and he played music in our town, and we were very excited, because all these special people were coming to play music, because they were trying to bail out the farmers. The farmers were going broke. And they said, well, hey, you know, the government said, we're going to subsidize you to grow corn. We want you to grow as much corn as you, want, as you can, because we're going to find out what to do with that corn. And it turns out we processed that corn into things like high fructose corn syrup, so that we could make things shelf stable. At the same time in the 80s, a lot of women were going into the workforce more. There was a lot more push towards having easy processed food that we wanted to eat quickly, like Cheerios, for example, right? And so, again, you know, there's this push, and if we can work on decreasing those processed carbohydrates, if nothing else, we can certainly um, make, it, hopefully, some big headway um, as it relates to our weight. And when we're talking about planning our portions, the other thing to talk briefly about is the idea of eating in a certain time frame. This is the latest and greatest thing out there, if you haven't seen uh, other things on social media, et cetera, is the timing of eating. It turns out there are three things that we need to think about when we think about eating. And it's not eat less and exercise more. That's what we've said for years. That doesn't work. If you eat less and exercise more, eventually your body just burns the same amount of calories and you don't lose weight. Okay, the less you eat, the less calories you burn, and then you're kind of stuck, right? Unless you become a marathon runner and you really eat less, like you have to really jack the differential there to make it successful. But just exercising a little more, going to the gym a couple times a week, and eating less, it just sort of, you end up balancing out again and you don't lose, because your body protects, again, that set point, right? It protects that, it goes back to that, it makes you hungry, it drives you to eat again. So the thing to talk about, really, in terms of eating, is not eating less so much, I mean, quantity still plays a role, but it's eating differently as it relates to the timing of our eating and as it relates to the quality of our food, right? That's why I said the quality, whole foods, not processed foods, and the timing is another big factor. Here in this study, it showed that what we call time-restricted feeding, meaning in this study they ate from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m., which is an eight-hour window, um, was more effective in, in getting rid of body fat than eating in the normal sort of 12 hour window, eight to eight. But even then, we, people eat a lot more than that these days, meaning a lot of us will have a snack at 10 o'clock or something before we go to bed and then eat again at six o'clock in the morning. So we don't have that 12 hour window even um, to give our bodies a rest. It turns out there's a good thing to fasting. When we fast like that for at least 12 hours, it upregulates up our fat burning, as well as other things like getting rid of bad cancer cells and other factors. We have to plan our plate because um, planning our plate is key because this sort of plan, vegetables, fruits, whole grains, healthy protein, just doesn't happen naturally sometimes. Um, we're fortunate here at the Mass General Hospital that we have a very excellent cafeteria that provides some really great options for us to plan our plate for us. Uh, whereas, you know, a lot of times you go out into the world and you might not have such good choices. I just got a hummus cup from the Coffee Central there. I love the hummus cup. It's spinach and hummus and carrots and celery and olives, and I could easily make that myself at home, but I don't plan. I have a problem with this, right? <laughs> and so I don't have that stuff at home right now. And so, again, I, but I can thankfully get it at the Coffee Central instead of just a donut, right? I mean, the Coffee Central could just have donuts for me. Um, which you know would, would be certainly a good thing. We had a question there. No, I'm sorry, you know, if you could ask questions. Um, how does this apply to, let's say, teenagers? And teenagers? There, there, I was thinking about the restricted time. You said yeah, they, you know, how it applies to everybody. So the question was, how does the, the time-restricted eating apply to, to, to kids as well? And we do think that it applies to kids just as much as it applies to, to adults, right? So this idea, again, that the food is around all the time now, it used to be, I mean, I remember even back in my day, I mean, we, you know, if you didn't make it, I mean, we didn't have granola bars sitting around or other things. I mean, we had some apples or something like that, but again, we didn't really want that at 10 o'clock at night, so we decided we weren't hungry enough to decide to eat an apple. If we were hungry enough to decide to eat an apple, we did, but, but that's what we had laying around. If we wanted to have cookies, we had to make cookies, right? Um, and so again, having that sort of at least 12 hour window um, is a good thing. Having a little bit longer window can potentially be better, but that's not for everybody. I mean, some people have a struggle with, you know, trying to decide when they're going to eat. But deciding when you're going to eat is, is the point, whether it be 
restricted to a time period or whether it just be like I'm gonna eat breakfast lunch dinner again that works out a little bit better so often in our lives we're so busy today especially with the kids I mean my own child in particular as well I mean it's a hassle because you have soccer practice that goes from 6 to 7 30 and then when you're gonna eat right if I don't get home I'm not home at 4 30 to make him dinner you know so we end up having to go to soccer and come home and eat after soccer which is not a good thing for any of us. So trying to work on that in our schedules is very challenging. Some of that we've created you know, in America by our scheduling. So quantity is important and it can't be ignored, but the quantity of what is the problem, right? If you eat, this is just illustrating here, if you eat 400 calories of oil, you fill your stomach, stomach up this much. 400 calories of beef fills it up this much. But 400 calories of vegetables <laughs> fills that baby all up, right? And so when we talk about feeling full, we feel fuller when we eat low carbohydrate, leafy vegetables full of fiber, right? So this is the idea of volumetrics um, put forth by a prominent dietitian in the country named Barbara Rolls, who really has this idea that the more volume you eat, if you're a volume eater, and it turns out some people are volume eaters, some people really want to feel that feeling of fullness every time they eat, that's fine, that's good. But you're not going to feel that fullness if you're eating chicken nuggets here from McDonald's, right? Not as much so as you're eating a, a giant big salad from, from, you know, from home or from some other place. So to talk about that, that fasting just a little bit more. So this idea of when we eat being important. It's good for your metabolism. It, decreases, it increases that fat burning. Um, there's benefits to aging now as well as cancer research. So there's a lot of research going on as this applies to treating cancer or reducing cancer risk in the future. And there are various ways of doing it. We've talked about this time-restricted feeding, which is to eat in a time-restricted period. And in the case of the studies that are coming out, it turns out 18 hours of fasting is where you get sort of the most benefit, um, you know, it reaches a plateau at that point. So 12 hours is good, 18 hours is even better, okay? Um, if you can do that, that's not for everybody. I can't do that because I like to eat breakfast in the morning. And so it's hard for me to go from eight to two to eat because I want to eat dinner with my family at night too. So it just doesn't work for me socially. So I have to accept that. Because the other thing you should take away is what works for you is gonna work for you. People come in all the time. Should I do the paleo diet? Should I do the keto diet? Should I do the wheat belly diet? Should I do the whole food diet? Should I do this? Right, the point is what's gonna work for you? Figure out what works for you and then stick with it and stick with it forever. Bless you. Um, the other ways to do this fasting is to consume only 500 calories for dinner one to two times a week. So the idea is you would eat dinner one night and you would eat a small dinner, 500 calorie dinner, so like a soup and salad or something, um, and then you would not eat again until dinner the next night. So that has you fasting for 24 hours and you do that twice a week instead of you know, every day. The time restricted feeding you do every day. For the, you fast for 18 hours and you eat for six. The other way to do it, the, the, um, again, at a minimum, we should all try to not eat for 12 hours. And so again, when I go to grab that thing at 10 o'clock at night, because I think to myself, oh, I should just have a handful of chocolate chips. I did have a handful of chocolate chips last night, so I gave in, right? There's some times when you're doing your charts at 10 o'clock at night and you say to yourself, I just need some chocolate chips. But again, I ruined, I messed that up, right? I had those at 10 o'clock, so I'm not gonna be my 12 hour fast. I accepted that and I move on, right? I don't beat myself up about that at the next day I try to do it again. Right? And so the, um, having that 12 hours is key. The other way to think about doing this is called the fasting mimicking diet. And again, I don't like the word diet, but the point is that it's a lifestyle, it's a diet, it's a plan to do for five days once a month. Um, and this, this dietary pattern that uh, Dr. Longo has created mimics the results of fasting as it relates to doing the fast for the 24 hours like we talked about. So the fasting mimicking diet um, Dr. Walter Longo at U USC, University of Southern California, has been doing this research mostly as it relates to aging and, and, and decreasing aging, right? Living longer, improving your longevity. That's where a lot of this research comes out of. It turns out when you fast for 12 to 16 hours, that's when you get this metabolic health benefit and weight management benefit, right? The same for a day, you fast for a day. That's called intermittent fasting. So I fast for 24 hours. I eat dinner and then I eat dinner the next night. You know, and I fast for 24 hours twice a week. That mostly helps this orange bar here, which is our weight management and our metabolic health. The way our insulin controls our fat storage, okay? So the way that insulin controls our fat storage 
is it's beneficial to not eat for certain periods of time for that to happen, for that fat storage to be, for that fat to be burning more. At two to three days of fasting, you get what's called autophagy, which is where your body attacks those cells that are not good for us, right? Those precancerous cells, those cells, there's always cells in our body that are bad and are having oxidative stress, right? There are cells that are in there, and then the idea is if they stay there, then they cause cancer later, right? They grow into cancer cells because your body has to check those cells every day. Get rid of that bad stuff, get rid of those bad Alzheimer's types of proteins that are building up, right? It has to clear those out so that you don't get Alzheimer's, right? And our body has to do that work. And giving your body some time to do that work is what happens after two to three days. At four to five days, which is this, uh, this fasting mimicking diet, you do that, again, up to once a month. You do that for five days, once a month. Um, you get stem cell rejuvenation after that four to five days. So that's where our stem cells are, cells in our body that can turn into anything. There's cells in our body that people get a transplant if they, need, if they have cancer, okay? They'll get a stem cell transplant. People will take the stem cells out of, uh, the doctors take our stem cells out of our body, they take them out of our blood, and they harvest them, and they collect them, they can find them, and then they give them back to you after chemo. Because those stem cells can make all of your cells over again. They're the progenitors of, of every human life, okay? And you can increase the production of those stem cells of your own body, but you have to get to this sort of four to five days. And that's not fasting totally. During this fasting mimicking diet, there's a, a, some calories that you take in, they're just special calories. Things like olives, things like fats. So there are things like um, fats that we need for our body uh, to, be, uh, to be functional, right? To still think clearly, et cetera. Um, so there's a book that he wrote that tells you how to do that with food, or you can buy these special products that you can use for those five days. And I have no connection with him, so nothing good. Uh, so plants and protein, that's what's really key to health. And this is the Mediterranean food pyramid. And again, the base of this pyramid is lots of plants and protein. The Mediterranean lifestyle has shown to be most successful here um, in weight loss. We have a low carbohydrate lifestyle in the purple. We have a, the yellow being a Mediterranean lifestyle and a red being a low fat. For the longest time with heart disease, we blamed it on fat in our country. So we had this low fat movement and we said, get rid of all the fat and what came in its place is Sugar, and so now we have a bunch of sugar, not as much fat, now we have all these problems with fatty liver disease and needing liver transplants, and our heart disease hasn't gotten any better, although we have better ways of fixing it with drugs and things like that, and the cardiologists you know, are really good at that. Um, and so here, this Mediterranean lifestyle is, is also lower carbohydrate in a sense, because the Mediterranean lifestyle is eight to 18 servings of vegetables and whole grains, not whole grains like Cheerios and bread, but whole grains like farro and quinoa and <coughs> barley, okay? Eight to 18 servings in total of those two things a day. That's what the Mediterranean people eat. Eight servings of vegetables. So it's probably not about what you don't eat, meaning it's probably not about don't eat this, don't eat that. It's probably about eat more vegetables, okay? There's a lot of good things in vegetables. These are the good things in vegetables, phytonutrients. These phytonutrients scavenge up those cells get rid of those cancer cells, decrease that oxidative stress. One of the key phytonutrients that, that I want you to remember is blueberries and, mm. and things in the dark berries, so all those dark berries. One of the big things that they have this is anthocyanins. So anthocyanins destroy free radicals. Free radicals are oxygen molecules that are running around in our body that, again, cause damage to our cells, right? Cause inflammation, lead to this vicious cycle of weight gain again, right? Because we're our body's fighting against these. Anthocyanins are, are found most predominantly in blueberries, which is why there's a lot of blueberry research going on as it relates to Alzheimer's prevention in particular, right? And so also heart disease. So if you can do anything else from today, improve your dietary quality, decrease your processed food consumption, and eat more blueberries. The other thing is fiber. Plants and protein give us more fiber, okay? So fiber's our friend. We need 30 grams a day we're all relatively fiber deficient anymore because we don't eat eight servings of vegetables because it's just hard to find them. It's hard to get them. It's hard to pack them. It's hard to buy them. It's hard to put them in the lunchbox. It's hard to, you know, the, all these factors play a role. There are no excuses, right? Again, if you want to make change, you have to decide to make change, right? And it's your responsibility if you want to change it. Change doesn't happen by itself, right? But at the same time, you know, we have to use some tools that we have. This fiber is really good also for our colon health 
as well as those gut bacteria. So those good gut bacteria, one of the fascinating parts um, about obesity is this idea that there's certain bacteria in patients that struggle with obesity, if we look at their stool, they have certain bacteria in there. If you look at the lean people, like Susie, when we sewed Susie over there, they have certain bacteria in their colon. So there is an obesogenic gut bacteria and a lean gut bacteria. And in mice, if you take the lean gut bacteria, you give it to the mice that struggle with their weight, the mice get thin, just from eating the other rat's poop, okay? And so that plays a big role. The other factor we know of for a fact in, in weight loss surgery, when we do surgery, which is part of the reversal of diabetes, is that when people have surgery, before surgery, their gut bacteria is obese. It's, it struggles with, you know, it's that obesogenic gut bacteria. A few, a week or so after surgery, that gut bacteria looks like the lean person. It looks like Susie's, okay? Just a week after surgery. So the surgery itself alters our, our gut microbiome and makes it go in a positive direction towards weight loss. Prebiotic fiber is key. Prebiotic fiber is in something called inulin. Inulin is a prebiotic fiber. You can find that in the store. Um, fiber Choice is one of the fiber supplements that has the inulin fiber in it. The downside of inulin fiber, because um, Metamucil had a great one. Um, I loved it, it was a powder, it was tasteless, it was wonderful, but unfortunately, um, people got a lot of gas from it. So inulin causes gas. When you increase your fiber, you get gas. And then everybody's calling the P&G hotline for Metamucil, saying, I got all this gas, and, you know? So they discontinued it, because patients, people were complaining too much. Um, and so again, more inulin, the better. From an from a eating perspective, the thing that has the most in the inulin that we eat on a regular basis are leeks, um, asparagus, and onions, okay? Um, you can eat a chicory root, <laughs> but it's kind of hard. <laughs> and dandelion. What did you mean about the supplement daily there on that last slide? Um, everybody should supplement their fiber, because most of us don't get 30 grams a day. Um, and so really taking a fiber supplement, whether that be fiber choice, metamucil, you know, some type of fiber supplement is typically beneficial, um, especially if you struggle with any kind of constipation, right? I mean, if you have any kind of constipation, you should definitely be supplementing your fiber. Um, and again, those of us over 50, um, join the club, um, you know, we really probably should supplement our fiber just from a colon health perspective. You know, taking a medication. So are you talking about a pill then, or are you talking about flax and... Uh... Flax is fine too, whatever you prefer. You can do it with food, certainly, or you can do it with with the fiber supplement, a Metamucil, Metafiber, any of those types of products. The pills, I tend to shy away from the fiber pills because there's not very much fiber in them. You have to take six of them to just get two grams of fiber, and I told you you needed 30. But the powders are usually five grams per serving, so they give you a little more bang for your butt. What other foods besides flax will help you increase your fiber? Mostly all the vegetables, right? So again, getting to that eight servings of vegetables a day. You know, whether that be something you blend up in a smoothie or something you eat, you know, with a fork. Um, but getting those vegetables is really what's key to increasing your fiber. Vegetables decrease inflammation? Yes. Mm -hmm. All those phytonutrients, yes. Yes, the anti-inflammatory diet, which is another food pyramid I could put up here. And again, the interesting part is if I put all the food pyramids up here, they all look relatively the same, which is lots of vegetables at the bottom, yeah. right? And remember fruit. Fruit is nature's candy. Fruit has some fiber, too. Like a banana has great fiber, but bananas are very high in sugar. And if you're trying to lose weight, I don't advise you eating bananas. It's not that they're not good for you. But if you're trying to lose weight, if you're trying to maintain your weight, get weight off, the banana has a lot of sugar. And you don't need that extra sugar. I tell people all the time that bananas grow at the top of a very tall tree. They have special equipment that goes up there like big, you know, like the electrical guys, right? They go up there with this big thing and they pick those bananas off the top. So if you're a monkey and you climb to the top, your reward is to get the banana. Right? That's what you get for climbing to the top. Right? So if you climb trees every day, you know, if you're Michael Phelps and you swim every day in the water, right, or you do some sort of exercise that's really intense, then you can eat bananas. But those of us that are trying to lose weight, probably not the best choice as far as weight loss goes. The berries are much better for us. And this is the idea. This is why it's so hard to lose weight. So the idea is that when we lose weight, um, we increase our appetite. Our body drives our body back to going back to increasing that appetite. These are all the signals that get released up to our brain. Our brain then says, hey, um, I've had enough food or I haven't had enough food, right? So there's a complex relationship between our gut and our brain uh, that controls how we eat and how much fat we have. So in a nutshell, eat plants and protein every three to four hours if you can. 
one to one and a half grams per kilo of ideal body weight is the amount of protein that you want to have daily. So that turns out for most people to be about 60 to 100 grams per day, depending on your weight, right? Depending on how big you are. If you're a bigger person, you're going to need more protein. If you're a smaller person, you know, from a, a muscular standpoint, less. Eat whole foods instead of processed foods. Try to fast for at least 12 hours at night when you're sleeping. Eat blueberries and mushrooms. I didn't talk about the mushrooms, but mushrooms are one of the most anti-inflammatory and anti-cancer um, uh, foods that we have available. Okay, so eating mushrooms a lot is a good thing for you. Uh, more fiber and protein to feel full, and that improved dietary quality. The quality of the food is what's really important. We're going to talk very briefly about the last two, the last two P's, okay, which is power and pillow. And physical activity is not to be, um, not to be minimized at all, but physical activity doesn't make you lose weight. So often people come into me and I say, what do you think is the biggest issue that you're struggling with with your weight? And the number one answer that I hear out of people's mouths is, I don't exercise enough. We have scientific data to prove you wrong, meaning exercise does not produce weight loss, unfortunately. The reason we exercise is everything on this wheel, which none of this stuff on this wheel is about weight loss, okay? This says all course mortality decreased by 30%, cardiovascular disease decreased by 35%, Type 2 diabetes risk by 40%, colon cancer by 30, breast cancer by 20. One of the biggest reasons to exercise mm -hmm. is decrease in depression by up to 30%. When I take the time in the morning to get up out of bed, when I don't want to get up out of bed because I'm tired, I'm not taking care of myself, and I'm too stressed, and I'm not sleeping well. But when I get up and I get on my Peloton bike, and I get up in the morning, and sometimes I don't want to, and I'm laying there, oh, I shouldn't, yes, I should. It's like little <laughs> angels and devils on my your shoulders. And then I get up and I do it, right? I feel so much better that day. And you would think that would be enough for me to get up every day and do it, but it still is a struggle, right? For me to say, I'm gonna get up out of my bed and I'm gonna go get on that bike. It turns out too, that doing certain types of physical activity is probably better for us than others. So doing high intensity interval training actually burns fat better and increases our metabolism a little bit better than just sort of walking. So for example, the, the key is with high intensity interval training, what's high for me is different than the guy on the other end of the screen of my Peloton bike, because that dude can produce some serious output. And he's calling out numbers. I'm like, where do you get those numbers? I'm at 100. He's at like 300. I'm like, OK, well, that's not, you know, I'm doing, I'm doing a third as much. But I'm dying here, right? I'm like on the other end going, I can't do this anymore, right? I'm dying. So my intensity and your intensity and your intensity are all different. But the idea is that you want to get high intensity. So even researchers have shown even 20 seconds of stair walking, OK, three times a day has been shown to improve your physical fitness. So go out and get in the stairwell, and you walk up the stairs as fast as you can in 20 seconds. So fast for me might be different than fast for my 11-year-old, might be different than fast for my 70-year-old my parent, right? So, but again, if they're going up as fast as they can, that's high intensity for them. And so doing that really has more benefit than just sort of strolling. But again, strolling is good. The other key thing to remember is not to sit. So everybody has to stand up right now. Stand up, I know it's hot in here. We're like dying in the heat. But stand up, because the longer we sit, the more, and if you can't, that's okay. Um, the more, the longer we sit, the more we store energy as fat. And if you sit for longer than 20 minutes, that puts you in a fat storage mode. And any more now, we're sitting a lot more. So the idea that sitting is the new smoking is really becoming you know, a reality. You can sit down now if you want. <laughs> the last thing is sleep, which is seven and a half hours is ideal, okay? This has been shown to prevent Alzheimer's, right? So the better you sleep, the more you sleep, the more your brain clears out all those proteins that are building up and causing things like Alzheimer's. It improves your mood greatly. You burn more calories when you're sleeping. I said that already. The more REM sleep you get, it turns out we don't get REM sleep till the end of our cycle. So that's why the seven and a half hours. We don't get as much REM in the beginning when we fall asleep. We get most of the, the REM increases in frequency the further we get in our cycle. And so the more REM we get, REM is a very active sleep that causes you to burn calories when you're in REM sleep. Your brain is like doing lots of stuff. Dreaming. Yeah, dreaming and like um, it, it processes stuff. It does a bunch of, like it's like a, you know, like when you, remember in the old days we had to defragment our hard drive on the computer? You had to push a button and it would like, it would take like five minutes to like clear off all the stuff, you know, that was bad. You know, now I guess it just it must do it all the time by itself. But, you know, that your brain's kind of defragmenting during that time and that takes energy, you know, for your brain to do that. It also decreases your food cravings. The, 
the more you don't sleep or if you don't sleep well, you crave things the next day. When I was classically, when I was on call as a resident, this was when we stayed up for 24, 48 hours in a row. We don't do that anymore because of your own house, so nobody, <laughs> nobody has an accident in the room. But um, we used to stay up for a long time, and the next day I would go like cafeteria and I would want that bacon, egg, and cheese biscuit or a donut, a big Danish. And I'm like, why do I want that? I usually don't want that food. I'm like, oh, I have to have a bacon, egg, and cheese biscuit. You know, because I had that craving because I was up all night. Does getting up at night, like, say, to, to uh, go to the bathroom, what is the impact on that? It is impactful. So the question was, if getting up in the night to go to the bathroom, I mean, anything you have to get up for, whether it's a crying baby or you have to go to the bathroom or um, you have a dog that jumps on you or a cat that jumps on you, you know, I try to encourage people to protect their sleep as much as possible. If you're getting up at night to go to the bathroom, you might ask your doctor for a medication that might help you not have to do that. You know, because as we get older, we sometimes have some of that issue. Or you might try to restrict your water intake past a certain time of day. You know, get most of your water in during the morning so that you can, you know, keep from getting up. Because yes, anything, anytime you get up, it messes up your sleep cycle. Because when you get up, your sleep cycles through stages one, two, three, four REM all night long. And then again, as it goes one, two, three, four REM, one, two, three, four REM, the REM cycles get longer, they get wider, mm -hmm. okay? But if you wake up, it has to start over again. You know, and so then you don't, you get that shorter REM right after that sleep when you go back to bed. So whatever you can do to protect your sleep, the better. That means no screens an hour before bedtime. That's the biggest thing you can do to protect yourself is no TV, no screens an hour before bedtime. Screens mimic our sleep cycle, okay? When we're looking at a TV or we're sleeping and you hook yourself up to brain waves, the neurologist has a hard time deciding whether you're sleeping or watching TV. Because the TV screen or the iPad screen or whatever screen you're watching mimics your sleep cycle, it makes your brain think it's sleeping, and, but it's not really, and then it's a bad thing. So real briefly at the end, I'll save some time for questions. Um, we'll talk a bit about obesity. If you struggle with obesity, which is that BMI greater than 30, or um, uh, um, excess uh, body fat that you're struggling with that's causing effects of your health, we have hope and we have help, um, especially um, at, at obesity medicine specialists across the, uh, across the country, like myself, uh, that do this for a living and help you. There are now um, over 3,000 of us in the country uh, that can help uh, with obesity. The, the key clincher is here that 65% um, of people, patients, feel like obesity is a disease, 80% of healthcare professionals now. So we're doing better about that, meaning people aren't blaming themselves as much as they used to, okay? Um, so more people are believing it's a disease. But here's the problem. 82% of people think that they can treat it completely on their own, that it's their own responsibility. What disease do you know of that people come in and say, I have breast cancer, um, I wanna just treat it by myself. You know, most people, I mean, you don't wanna have cancer, you don't wanna you know, be in that position, um, but you recognize you need help and you need treatment for it. Um, and this is the same thing. So at the Weight Center, we have a comprehensive center. We take care of adults and kids of all ages. Um, we have the most certified obesity medicine specialist, I think, in the country in one location, in one clinic. Um, so we're certified by the American Board of Obesity Medicine. Um, and uh, we have an amazing multidisciplinary team. Uh, these are our weight center physicians. Uh, Dr. Fatima Cody Stanford just uh, wrote a book. It's out there in the hallway in the case. I'm not sure if it's available probably for purchase in the gift store, um, but it's about um, the disease of obesity and what you can do about it if you're interested in finding out more. Uh, we have our surgical team here, which are amazing surgeons uh, that, that do this work for patients. Our dietitians, psychologists, because behavior change is hard. Um, it's hard to sustain, it's hard to keep going. And so psychologists help you to be able to do that. And our pediatric providers, people that take care of kids. And the real issue is this, like I said, as, you struggle, as your health risks go up and your BMI goes up, you have to increase your treatment intensity. It's just the reality of life, it's not anybody's fault but it's just the way that, that treatment is. If your BMI is in the 30 range or 27 with some sort of other medical condition, so if you're overweight with diabetes or overweight with some other medical condition, then medications have been shown, combined with lifestyle modification, so combined with all the things we talked about, combined with the five Ps, right? If you add medication to your treatment, just like you add medication for your diabetes or you add medication uh, for your blood pressure, if you add medication at that realm, you increase your intensity and you increase your weight loss efforts. You improve your ability to lose more weight. So your clinicians aren't just going to 
going to prescribe surgery. There might no, be other things. No, there are other things. There's this there's medications and there's a balloon now too, you know, that you that you can get inserted that's in the middle. And then there's surgery at the top. The reality is again, it's a pyramid and everybody has to do things at the bottom, right? Otherwise it falls down. Right? And there are medications that help these people because the studies have shown that these people can get benefit from medications, right? But if your BMI is greater than 40 or your BMI is greater than 35 and you have another medical condition, especially diabetes, um, then surgery is your best option for creating the best results. That's just the same as if you have lung cancer and surgery is the recommended treatment, not radiation or chemo depending on the lung cancer, right? And so that's just the reality of the fact that as you're as you get more and more problems with things, you need a more powerful tool to get to where you need to be. And that's the amazing part, is that surgery puts diabetes in remission. 70% um, of the time, even at five years. Okay, so again, it's a very powerful tool to reverse diabetes and improve health. People live on average seven years longer when they have surgeries and seven years happier too. Not just longer, but, but more, more functional, have more ability to do things and get around. And this is how medications help. This is an example of a medication used for the treatment of obesity. Um, what they did here is they had people lose 5% initially. So they took those people that were good at losing weight. They said, hey, if you can lose 5% of your weight by doing the five Ps, right? If you can lose 5%, we're gonna randomize you and put you in this study. So those people that were successful in losing 5%, they put them in the study. The people in this black line here were given placebo. They were given this medicine, but it wasn't real, right? They thought they were getting medicine, but they weren't. The people in the purple line were getting medicine. And you can see the people in the purple line added another 6% weight loss to their, to their abilities by, by taking that medication in addition to doing the lifestyle changes that these people were already, that these people were doing. And these people, you can see, they kind of stalled out, right? Because they, this is what happens, this is life. This is physiology, this is the human body. And this is surgery, this is where surgery, these lines here show the different diseases associated with surgery that, that surgery treats. So diabetes is in this purple line right here, and you can see here that 70% of people, their diabetes is gone. And this continues out further, you know, out along, um, out, we have now data um, out to five, 10 years um, with the surgery. So if you're interested in coming to the Wade Center, um, we have an orientation, a new patient orientation that we hold uh, a couple times a month, uh, usually in the evening, different times a day. We hold orientations up in Danvers, our Danvers location. We hold orientations here at the main campus. But you can come, it's free, and we tell you more about the Weight Center, what it has to offer, all the programming it has to offer, both the medical and the surgical uh, options for treating your weight or helping with your weight. And these are just a summary of some of our programs. We have our medication program, our surgical program, and our lifestyle programs that we have to help people attain these goals that we talked about, help you get to the five Ps. So in summary, in the end, you know, pick one thing that you can work on and work on it each week, whether that's your water intake, we didn't talk about that much, but that's very important as well. Um, whether it's eating more plants, right? I'm gonna try to eat one more plant today, one more vegetable today. Um, but make an effort to do something each week. Focus on yourself and value yourself, right? So often we don't value ourselves enough to put that effort towards ourselves. And so it's really about valuing what's going on in your body more than the donut, right? So when I was walking through the train station today, I said, oh, I really want a donut. I didn't sleep well, I really want a donut. The donuts are right there, they're right in front of me, I have to look at them, I have to walk past them, and I'm like, ugh, I shouldn't have a donut though, because I'm really trying to lose weight, I'm trying to keep it. But this is the discussion I have in my head, walking through the train station, <laughs> like 30 feet, right? And then, but I finally get to the other end of the door, I'm like, whew, I'm out, I'm past it, <laughs> right? But that's the kind of stuff we have to do today, to, to fight back against all the stuff that's around us. It's not that you're not, you're not. It's not uh, to say that every now and then you can give yourself a donut. Correct, we say you wanna do things 80% of the time. But again, a lot of times that turns out to be, once you have one donut, that turns out to be every day, and then it's not 80% of the time anymore. Where is the packet that was mentioned or something? Of the oh, we, that's when you come to the orientation, um, if you wanna be part of the Weight Center, we have a, a orientation, a packet you fill out with information about your history. Is it so, based for orientation on your website? Or? Um, they are not right now. Um, we're, oh, we're putting up, yeah. I know, I know. Um, that's a good point. Um, but um, there are, so um, you can uh, call the Weight Center. Um, uh, uh, here's the 726-4400 or weightcenter.org. And um, for, give us a call and we'll tell you when the next orientation is. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Oh, I just wanted to give you a question. When you're talking about fasting, 
So the 12 power, no, no food, just drinking liquids. Uh, it's okay. If you can, how about medicines, if you take medicines right before bed? That's fine, that's fine. It's okay. just that you, know, um, you want to do water, no calorie liquids. Okay. Right, so no cream in your coffee, but you can have black coffee, you can have bl you know, black tea, you can have water. If, 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 if apple, for example. Apple? Apple. Yes. I put in the period where we power period. Can you eat apple? Can you eat an apple? No. no. You have to fast completely. <laughs> you know, it's about having no calories going through your body. It turns out we used to do that back in the day, right? We didn't have apples in the fridge. We had to go get the apples and we had to bring it back to our cave. <laughs> we, you know, we, so there's something special about not eating for that 12 hour period. When most of us should be sleeping, right? But mm -hmm. that's the problem is a lot of us aren't sleeping anymore. You mentioned blueberries as a superfood. What yes. about um, red grapes? Um, so a little bit, they have some resveratrol in them, um, but not as much of the anthocyanin and they're not dark enough. Um, and grapes have a lot more sugar. They're not bad, but I mean, you know, again, they just have more sugar. So if you're, if you're trying to lose weight, you know, you might not want that much sugar because sugar is what you burn as fuel. And if you want to burn the fuel that's around your midsection instead of the fuel that you put in your mouth. I had a question about the surgery. Uh, when you talk about forever with the weight loss, what percentage of patients regress and end up putting the weight back on even after the surgery? So, so um, the vast majority of people, so um, in the studies, 98% of people have still lost 5% um, even at 10 years after surgery. So again, like 5% isn't very much, but, but the vast majority, nobody, Almost nobody, only 2% of people, gain it all back, okay? Um, you're expected to gain back 20% of the weight you lose over the course of the 10 years. So you lose the most weight in the first year or two, um, and then our bodies just naturally gain weight, oh, you yeah. know, whether you're having surgery or not. But 20%, if you lose 100 pounds with surgery, and you gain back 20 pounds, right, mm -hmm. you're still 80 pounds down. Right, which you would never be with any other, I mean, it's hard to get there. Yeah. Like I said, only one out of 100 people can do that by themselves, you know, with, with, with other, mechan and a little bit more with medicine, right? We're getting to the point where medications help a little bit more. You know, again, it's a pyramid, right? The more effect you want to get, the more you have to add on things. One of the other big struggles we have in our country is that, again, um, a lot of the insurance, a lot of the employers don't think that obesity is a disease either. Mm -hmm. And so they don't cover medication. Only about um, 30 to 40% of employers cover medication for obesity treatment, although most of them cover surgery. That's because that was mandated quite a while ago. I mean, the surgeons got together and really put forth an effort a long time ago to make sure they had coverage. Um, but uh, medications, we're on the forefront right now trying to get medications covered for people. For example, Medicare doesn't cover medications, yet they cover surgery. Um, for obesity. Um, there's an act called the Treat Reduce Obesity Act that's before Congress right now uh, that would get medications covered for Medicare beneficiaries. So if you're into lobbying at the, at the national level, um, put a word in for the Treat Reduce Obesity Act so you can um, get medications covered. Because medications make it more successful for people. Are there other industrialized, I don't know what the correct word is, advanced societies or more, more um, not richer, but yeah. Uh, are they? Do they? I, I, are they in the same struggling? Way? Yes. So the question was, are other societies struggling as well? And yes, they're catching up with us. So um, uh, Saudi Arabia is a big area uh, where they're struggling, and their genetics are different too. So people of Asian descent, as well as we didn't talk about that much, but Asian, Latino American um, people, um, different nationalities, store energy as fat better. Um, as it relates to that processed carbohydrate food environment. So in response to that environment, right, um, these, so as that environment is making its way into these other cultures, then these other cultures are struggling with, um, with uh, the same, the same thing, thing, yes. The, and even worse, at even a lower rate. So in Asia, for example, you get diabetes much sooner at a lower weight than you do in America, a, a person who's, or I mean a person who's, born, you know, from America, I mean, genetic-wise. There's no other way to reverse diabetes other than the bariatric surgery? So it's the weight loss, it's, it's the surgery, um, 
as a tool, right? When we talked about the gut bacteria, we talked about, we didn't talk much, but it alters biochemical hormones related to um, the development of diabetes. So it's the surgical tool at this point that, that reverses the diabetes. It's like the surgery, the medication, right? To put it in, we like to talk about remission, right? So it puts the diabetes into remission. So losing weight and taking medicines would never equal what bariatric, we, bariatric we, surgery is. We don't know the answer to that because we haven't done that study. But we think that probably, but we think it's that amount of weight loss, right? I mean, it's that, for a lot of people, it's that, it's that 30 to 40% weight loss that you get with surgery. So with medication, the best you can get is around, you know, 15, 20% weight loss. Um, with, we talked about with behavior, you can get about five to 10%, right? With medication, you can get up to 15, 20%. With surgery, you get 30 to 40% of your absolute weight loss. So again, if you, if you weigh 200 pounds, you know, you're gonna lose 80 pounds. Um, and be, you know, in much better position, right? So it's that amount of weight that makes yeah, it. Yeah, but then don't you have to take all kinds of supplements, and isn't there problems with absorption? No, nope, not with the newer procedures. So we don't have as much trouble with absorption, um, and um, uh, even with the gastric bypass, it really it only absorbs some micronutrients. It doesn't malabsorb calories as much. Uh, it's really more of the 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 appetite control that that gut brain slide that I showed. Um, that gut brain slide, um, that's what it alters the surgery and it makes it, uh, makes it more able to, that's too far back, anyway. Um, that, that gut brain slide that I showed makes it more, um, surgery alters that so that you have this different interaction between your brain and your gut and your fat storage. I have one last question, sorry. <laughs> Like, we'll get, we'll get what this medications one. is the weight center prescribed? So the question was, what medications is the weight center prescribed? There are, um, there are um, uh, four to five, depend, there are about five medications that we have approved now for the treatment of obesity, a little more depending on which options you consider. Um, but we prescribe all of them, um, all of the medications that are approved for the treatment of obesity. Uh, we prescribe all of those medications. Um, and it depends on you, the individual person, like what medication might work best for you, given the side effects, uh, given your other medical history and other issues that you struggle with, there are different medications that might work better in different people. And how about side effects? Which kind of side effects? So the question was about side effects. Um, there are side effects to any medication, and certainly uh, the side effects, uh, you know, you have to take into account. Some of those side effects can be um, <coughs> anxiety, um, you know, uh, um, nausea, upset stomach, uh, things like that, that that you have to take into account. But relatively controllable is the point. You know, tolerable um, side effects, nothing too horrible. Are they stimulants? What are what would be an example of a medicine? Um, one of our most common medications is a stimulant called fentramine. But again, where it's working is on that brain center, mm -hmm. so it's not really working by stimulating you by making you more revved up. It's working on that brain center to decrease your appetite. Thank you all for coming. It's been a great uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank and you. go forth and be well <laughs> and eat more vegetables. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.